Hi, this is my third video on the topic of different fractions of, of class, different um, parts of the class system of a modern society and, and how, how, how being in a particular class position has an impact on how you think about environmental politics. And, and in particular, how, how you think about the, 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 the environmentalists and scientists who, 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 who were seen as responsible for, for pushing a particular view of the environmental crisis. Okay, so according to, um, you know, like as I said um, in, in previous talks on this, um, the, the Ehrenreichs talk about the professional managerial class and another term which we might just call the middle class. And Bourdieu uh, looks at it in more detail in the sense that he sees different fractions of this middle class. Um, so, so environmentalists and scientists are from the part of the middle class that is higher in formal educational qualifications, which Bourdieu calls cultural capital, and yet and lower in economic capital. So if you compare them with like, I don't know, um, executives in business who are ma managers in, 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 bis in, in, in businesses or um, shopkeepers or whatever like that. They're, they're, they're all, I mean, both of these, all of these people are part of the middle class or the professional managerial class, but, but the people who are uh, lecturers at university or, or high school teachers or primary school teachers or whatever, or, um, or in the arts and culture and so on, are higher in educational qualifications and don't have the same economic clout. Um, <clears throat> so those in the practical applications of science, like engineers working for companies and commercial executives, are lower in cultural capital and higher in economic capital. And then, then we can talk about a third section um, <clears throat> of the class structure, which is like what the Marx's famous capitalist class, it's business, and we can just talk about them, broadening that out a bit, or to business leaders are higher in economic capital and, and middling in cultural capital. So the first, so I'm going to talk about, first of all, the groups in the middle class that are, that are critical of environmentalists, and then I'm going to talk about um, the business community's response to environmentalists and environmental science. Okay, so uh, here, here the, the interviews that uh, um, I'm going to talk about are uh, one with somebody uh, who I'll call Daphne from the police force. Um, and the second person is Beth, who's the wife of a mining engineer. And the third person is a commerce graduate uh, called Petronella. In other words, all three of these people are part of the middle class, but they've got more economic capital than the environmentalists that they critique, or, or, or in, in, in Petronella's case, a potential for more economic capital. Um, at the same time, they're also part of the same middle class that the environmentalists themselves come from. We'll see that their critique of environmentalists is, is slightly different from that of of the working class that I talked about in the last talk. Okay, let's look at Daphne first of all from the from the um, police force. She, she talks about forest activists who who um, at that time in 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 the Hunter region in eastern Australia, uh, there, there was a lot of forest activism in in the hinterlands, um, protecting uh, native forests from from logging, and. Um, and blockade often that was in the form of a blockade, and and she, her view was that forest activists were paid by the conservation movement, so they're not really voluntary volunteers in the sense they're almost pay, paid professional activists. Um, she attacks them for their failure to follow the norms of the Puritan work ethic, and she has a go at them for, in her view, being untidy, unclean, and not properly washed, and so on. And she finds their cultural choices bizarre, alien, and and not, not the one she would make herself. So he, he here's the quote. She says, I find them a sort of alternative breed. We had to fumigate the police station last time they were in. They absolutely stunk. It was unbelievable. They're all kids, never work, just living off the government. They're actually just people that don't really want to fit in with the rest of the society and they're not interested in working hard or anything like that. 
they're interested in dropping out. They said, well, why don't you come along to the next rally? And you think, well, I've got to wear no deodorant and eat chickpeas and brown rice. I don't think I'll be part of that. So, so, so her, her, her critique of them as culturally alien attacks them for not being hardworking, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness and, and hard work's part of that whole package of Puritan values. And, and in a way, that, those Puritan values are associated with the success of the capitalist economy. And so these are people who don't want to work and they drop out. They're trying to sponge off the government. They're, they're lazy and so on. Um, so, 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 th so this is a slightly different critique from the one we're hearing from working class people, but it's got some some elements of, of similarity in the so far as the 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 uh, um, high cultural capital middle class young people are being attacked for their lack of realistic values that can help them to integrate into the economy. You know, like in, in that sense, there's a sort of slight alliance there. And let's now move on to Beth, the wife of the mining engineer. She was herself trained as a photographer, and she now stays home to look after her children. <coughs> she criticised the environmentalists for the practical, impractical ethical decisions. First of all, she talks about her property, her rural property that she owns with her husband. And, um, and she says, the greenies don't want you to burn off, so they're making it more difficult. You've got to have a building permit virtually to burn off, like our neighbours around here. Okay, okay. so the idea of the building permit is that, again, like we saw with, with some of the working class interviewees, that greenies are a section of the middle class that's got control of some aspects of government and are making life difficult for everybody else. Like our neighbours around here, they fancy themselves as greenies. They don't want the burning off until now. They've seen the devastation that it caused like the bushfires. And where we had our farm, whatever, in Canberra, there, were, there was a mob down the end. Oh, sorry. She worked for some government department, Department of Lands or whatever in Canberra. So, I, okay, she identifies this neighbour as middle class as she would be because they own a hobby farm. Um, and they have never burnt off. They have never cleared their land of even all the weeds. So all the scotch thistles and everything are coming up because they just want it for the wombats and you know. They've gone completely the other way and there's noxious weeds and they won't even pull those out. Now it's just invaded the whole property. I mean, but you don't go crazy with these things. You don't just go and burn everything either. I mean, back burning. When you're burning off, you do it sensibly. That's what we tried to do. So like, yeah, okay. So so, so the, the pr productive farm is one where weeds, noxious weeds, which are a danger, to cattle and, co and cause trouble for productive agriculture, like grazing of cattle and so on, uh, are, are allowed to proliferate to the point where you can't even, you know, have cattle on your farm because it's too much undergrowth of weeds. And like, and like okay, and then, and then of also, of course, this causes a fire hazard and, and, they, and they don't care because what, what are they worrying about? They're worrying about the wombats. So, that, so, that, so that this middle-class fraction, the environmentalist fraction, uh, are, are, are people who, who, are not, who are not part of the, the real economy. They, they're, they're opting out to some extent from the economic productivity of agriculture and, and doing things for sort of bizarre ideological reasons. Um, So, so in a way, in a way, there's a, a, an echo of the idea of the work ethic that we we found in the first interview that I, I've explained today, which is that um, you, you know, you know, she, um, the police officer says um, that th these are young people who who are trying to save the forest and they don't want to work. And what and what Beth is saying is that uh, they, these are middle class, middle aged people owning a hobby farm. Who, who don't want to use their land for a productive work, you know, economic purpose. <clears throat> and then Beth goes on to explain the way she sees environmentalists and, and he or she looks at them as a culturally different section of the middle class. Okay, so some of the ones that I know who are middle class people, on the weekends they like to dress sort of hippie-ish, you know, and they go to the Wilderness Society shop and buy all their Christmas presents and that. Well, that's fine. 
But I don't always know if they actually do as much as they say they do, the sort of thing about certain things. I think it's just an image for them rather than getting out there and doing anything. They're still living in the 60s, I suppose. I mean, if you stuck them out in the log cabin in the bush, they wouldn't be there for very long, I don't think. So, so, so what she's saying is that, that these, these people have a pretense of being ascetic, you know, like ASC, E-T-I-C, meaning like a monk. They have a pretense of being pure, like Bourdieu talks about this high cultural capital. They reject material values and so on. They try and live a simple lifestyle, a pure lifestyle for spiritual values and so on. So what that's what we've got here. These middle-class people are making a pretense by wearing old hippie clothes and stuff like that. And they're pretending that they don't buy consumer goods uh, consumer glitzy consumer presence, but they go to the wilderness society and buy, you know, rational, sensible, pure presence and so on. But she she attacks this. She says this is just a pose. It's it's ridiculous. They they're actually going in their cars and get, doing their shopping just the same as she is for Christmas. But they're going to the wilderness society shop. And and and. <clears throat> And this, and this, and, and this, this uh, it's just an image for them, works within the Puritan discourse in which ostentation, showing off, just doing things for, for image rather than, you know, expressing yourself as you really are, you know, like that's the Puritan way to do things. The, the Protestant work ethic is embodied in this, you know, like, you know, walking the walk, talking the talk, you know, like all that kind of stuff. So they, they don't do that according to her. No, they're showing off. Just you, like we like we saw in the, in some of the other working class interviews, the hippie image affected by Greenies pretends that environmentalists are the kind of people who would live a subsistence lifestyle in the bush. You know, otherwise pairing back to nothing and certainly nothing industrial. But this is really a pose. They're no different to the rest of the middle class who get in their cars to go Christmas shopping and they have money to buy expensive presents. And now I'm just going to talk now about why she says she'd never vote for an environmentalist party. I mean, you can't just vote for someone because they've got some environmental issues that they want fixed because that's not going to help run the country. So, so, so this, this is a very interesting thing. The term running the country refers to the idea of making the capitalist economy run, work smoothly environmentalist opposition to the growth economy, their kind of mad uh, ideas of shutting down the coal industry or, or whatever it may be, are the kind of things that makes them unreliable for this necessary task of government running the country. So, so what we get here is a very um, kind of almost like a class-specific uh, critique of environmentalists, which, which is slightly different to the working class critique of environmentalists. Working class people say, these environmentalists have no understanding of our working class situation. They do things which are going to cause us trouble and we'll end up without a job and so on. Well, Beth doesn't, doesn't express it in that way. She has a somewhat similar uh, allied critique, but it's not expressed in that way. It's about the whole idea of the economy working. And of course, from the, from the point of view of, of that section of the middle class, the working of the economy is absolutely essential to their own to their own income and lifestyle, you know, like the husband is a mining engineer, so he's working in mining, um, and, and the mining industry is obviously really important to them, and, and similar industries, extractive industries that, that that environmentalists might might oppose. Okay, so and then another another thing she talks about is how they're too extreme. I mean, I think they're necessary meaning it might be necessary to have some sort of environmentalist pressure on governments. And they might be very radical to start with. And I think that's necessary to get the politicians thinking. Because if you don't have the radicals, well, nothing happens. It's like with every movement that's ever happened. And then after a while, all the radicals are pushed aside and the normal people flow through. So, so the, no, the normal people are the, are, 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 are the people who, who have a, a good sense of how of material in needs and the needs of the economy and so on, whereas uh, environmentalists are a cultural group that's outside of the norms of respectability and good sense. All right, now I'm going to talk about the commerce graduate Petronella. Oh, do you think... So she was interviewed by a sister Maria, and Maria goes... 
Do you think our lifestyles are filled with high levels of unnecessary consumption and waste? And Petronella says, they were before, but now I think with environmental awareness, it's resorting back to people being careful. So no, there's not really a wastage, I don't think. So yes, resources are going to be wasted and alternatives have to be found, viable alternatives. Actually, these things are being sort of looked after because people are trying to create solar powered cars and electric powered cars and things because they realize that the resources are going to waste. So, so viable alternatives are those which make economic good sense, right? Rather than unviable alternatives are the ones that environmentalists and greenies are promoting, which don't make economic good sense. And the, and, and the second thing that's implied in, in, this, in this rave is that the market economy will end up by sorting these things out as consumers become more aware. So we don't need huge government intervention and regulation or subsidies for environmental uh, renewable energy or anything like that, or certainly not a carbon tax. We, we need none of these things because uh, the, the market economy will sort out these problems as consumers become more aware and make different purchasing choices. And it's very interesting because she doesn't actually uh, think that uh, uh, her own consumer choices, she, she refuses to take any uh, input from environmentalists. <coughs> okay, so let, she rejects any government interference with consumption. So Maria, her sister says, how do you think we can make people consume and waste less? Petrona says, I don't think you can do that. There's no way you can force people. People are used to a standard of living. So, so, so the problem with the environmentalists is that they, they, they get the year of government and then they try and force ordinary people to curtail their consumption choices. So their freedom is undermined by this. Um, she says that she likes to drive her own car to and from work by herself. Uh, um, she uses makeup that may have been tested on animals. And she says, I don't really care because I don't know what it's been tested on. She says that if she had a baby, she and she doesn't intend to, she would use paper nappies because she thought the thought of washing a cloth, cloth nappy makes her sick. Uh, she does not recycle because she doesn't have the time and rejects recycled paper. She likes nice, clean paper that makes a good impression, not recycled paper, which is often like toilet paper. And she says that organically grown vegetables are too expensive. So there are limits on uh, on the consumer choices, the uh, environmentalist consumer choices that she's making herself. And the classic statement on that comes later. And she says, Maria says, what would she do in a situation where an environmentally friendly product was not available? Maria says, would you still buy it? It depends on whether the product's a necessity or not. Maria says, well, for example, hairspray. Petronella says, if there was no such thing as environmentally friendly hairspray, yes, I'd still buy it. All right, then would you buy an alternative product that was environmentally friendly if it was double in price? Petronella goes, in my monetary situation at the moment, no. If I had the money to burn, then maybe I would. The ideology is of the market economy is that complete freedom of choice for consumers the phrase money to burn suggests that the people who've got discretion to make environmental choices are, are those, those with lots of money, uh, the envied rich. And the green movement is forcing ordinary people to cut their consumer pleasures. Uh, she, she has a go at the green movement for, for imposing recycling on the community. She says she doesn't recycle her, her rubbish. Um, Oh, and she says that greenies are fanatics and people who force their opinion on you, <coughs> like certain lecturers at the university she studied at. And she says about rubbish, well, I don't believe they should make it legalised and enforce people in forcing them to recycle their rubbish. That's not really fair. I believe it should be up to the individual, like they're just talking about taking away all the large bins and making people have small bins so that you're forced to recycle but that's not really fair because, I mean, what are you going to have? 50 bins in your house, one for newspaper, one for glass, one for this. You've got no room. Your house will be a pigsty. So, so, so again, we get the echo of this idea, cleanliness is next to godliness. The trouble with environmentalists is that they, they're messy. Um, 
<laughs> but 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 also the idea that environmentalists are a section of the middle class that gets the year of government and then forces ordinary people to do certain things. And and what's not fair about that? They're just a minority pressure group, a lobby group, if you were. And and ordinary people end up by being uh, forced by legislation, which these uh, this annoying lobby group has has put into place. Uh, and on, on speaking about environmentalists, um, the, Maria um, asks, uh, you know, what do you think, what's a greenie or whatever? Petronella says, a greenie is a person who goes and ties themselves to trees so they won't be chopped down. An obsessive fanatic for the environment that takes it to the extreme. I picture the green politics just to care about the environment, not really with people. I picture them to be more concerned with environmental issues, not with people issues. I think that most people don't really know what the green movement's on about anyway. The only people that know what's going on about it are themselves. So, 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 so environmentalists are remote. They're part of a cultural elite. Uh, they're, they're enclosed off. Their cultural choices are bizarre and alien to the rest of society. Um, they're, they're extremist, um, you know. Um, and what we also find is a paradoxical attack on big business, which which is which is interesting because it's coming from the, the high economic capital uh, end of the middle class. And she says, it's the large scale corporations which causes most of the pollution and damage to the environment, like BHP, for example, and the waterways in Garden City. Sure, people's small problems help, but it's large corporations that have to change their habits as well. If they're not going to change, then why should the individual person changes? change she, she sees the, um, the government working hand in glove with the business class i don't believe the government really cares about the environment they just care about making profits for the country so so in, so in these this this um critique if you like uh is actually very similar to some of the working class you know like in other words we as individuals in a capitalist economy. It's run for the benefit of of the economic elites. We we don't have much control over this, and so on. So this is an interesting kind of like diversion, if you like, from the sort of pro capitalist uh, viewpoint of, of of this section of the middle class in general. All right. Now, what I'm going to talk about now is um, business leaders on environmentalism. Okay, so this is our research done by, by Vanessa Bowden, and, and part of this has been published as a paper, which um, I, I wrote the paper with her, and we called it um, Don't Shoot the Messenger. <laughs> okay, in other, in, in other words, that the scientists, environmentalists who, who are informing the public that, the, that we have various critical environmental problems, they don't like them, and, and it's like a case of shooting the messenger. So this, uh, these interviews were, were commenced in 2009 and they were also conducted in 2011. And again, it, it's interesting because of a particular point in history, but um, my analysis would be uh, these attitudes are still the background for a lot of the, you know, like the fact that the ALP and, 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 and definitely the Liberal National Party isn't moving that much on coal exports from Australia and, 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 and gas and you know, all this stuff is partly related to this kind of perspective that 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 comes through in these interviews. Richard uh, is someone who was from the finance industry. He was asked uh, about the carbon tax and he said, Paul House would say that now Paul House was at that time from the Australian Workers' Union. He would say, well, my workers down in the Illawarra would lose their jobs. You know, like, so the Illawarra is sort of like coal industry and, and a steelworks. And, you know, if they closed Port Kemba, there'd be massive unemployment in the Illawarra. Where are those jobs going to? Why don't we just shove them off to Queensland, Western Australia, some mine, fly in, fly out, equivalent to shovel out some old fossil fuels a bit more quickly. In other words, you could, you could, actually, you could move this stuff out of New South Wales and it wouldn't actually make any difference because the economy will dictate that other, uh, other parts of Australia would take up that option and employ these people, maybe some of them at any rate. And as fly in, fly out workers from New South Wales to Western Australia or whatever. 
<clears throat> is that the alternative employment they're likely to take? Meaning it's not any alternative from an environmental point of view, so why do it? Why, why make these restrictions? Or are there real jobs in, the lo in their local community that they can do now? I tell you what, I wouldn't be banking on something in the solar industry, given what we've seen in the last three years. So, so he's sceptical, you know, like that, 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 the, that the government will actually fund, sufficiently fund a, a solar industry to make it a viable source of employment for people displaced from the fossil fuel industries. And and what and what and what is a total classic of this uh, one of these interviews in general is that we often find this that the, these uh, leaders of the business community act like they're speaking for the working class. You know, it's not me. I, it's not because I want the economy to flourish, so I make lots of profits. Oh no, no, not at all. No, my my problem with is is I, I stand with ordinary people, and they need a job. You know, da da da. The, and so, so what in, ter, in terms of Bourdieu's analysis, that's 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 totally what you'd expect. That both the both the ruling capitalist elites and the working class sh share the, the the importance of the material economy. Uh, and 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 here, what we find is that the, the ruling class, capitalist elites, the wealthy elites, whatever, uh, are using are using this sh shared value system, which from Bourdieu's perspective is quite real, um, to 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 try and you know as sort of cannon fodder if you like the working class for, for for their for their political interests. Lisa, who was in uh, environmental management and maintenance, um, <clears throat> attacked the carbon tax that Julia Gillard was setting up at that time as negative and costly. Everything seems to be negative with this whole climate change thing. In other words, the carbon tax is taking money away from people or, or adding, yeah. And he said, if you can change the world, we can all do this, all that sort of stuff. Well, <coughs> where, oh, well, because of this climate change thing and all of these, you know, all of this situation, you're going to pay more for your electricity. You're going to pay more for your water. And now we're going to bring a carbon tax in and everyone is going to pay more for everything. So, so, so what we get here is a defense of ma the material interests like, Okay, so the problem with environmentalism is that it actually costs more and, and people have to pay more. And so they're not, not realizing their material interests as fully as they might if these green regulations weren't being imposed. So, so she's in favor of environmental reform. So just so long as they don't cost money. Uh, so this is to assert the priority of economic capital, which is her, her section of, of the class structure of the society as a whole. And, and you get the same theme from various other um, business leaders. Um, environmentalism is only sensible in so long as it fits with the market. So Paul, who was in shipping, said, I don't necessarily get hung up on whether there is climate change or not. Like, in other words, he's closet denialist. Does it make sense to be doing something to capture the carbon and do something with it? What I'm convinced of personally, and it's good business practices as well, is not to waste precious resources. So he's saying, okay, well, if carbon dioxide's a problem and a waste, surely there's a profitable way to make use of this resource. <coughs> well, is there? I mean, if there isn't, then, or then when we just let it go, you know, what can we do? What I do believe is in minimum, and this is Anthony, a consultant for business, is in minimizing footprint. Uh, on the environment, okay, that's a good thing to do. Minimize our footprint, maximize the efficiency of our industrial processes, because of course that's going to make money. Minimize waste and all those things that are traditional green things. I believe in them. I really hate this, the lies and the fear that comes from the greenhouse, the supposed greenhouse effect. <coughs> so in other words, the environmentalist ideas are, are fine insofar as they're all about efficiency and using resources and therefore making more profits. And here's Julia, uh, business advocate. You know, I guess there are community groups and organizations out there who are on the extreme side, meaning I'm not one of them. And there are others who just look at the economic side of things. They're the extreme, you know, <coughs> anti-environmentalists. And there are others who are a bit more neutral. And I guess that's what my organization is. So she's in an organization advising businesses on environmental change. 
considering all, all action that needs to be rational and kind of not de to be detrimental to businesses or to households, needs to have minimum impact on your life, but just be a more aware of your of what you're doing. So, so, so the outcome of all of these kind of statements is that there can be no action on environmental issues when, when that action would contradict the, is, the interests of the business and the economy. The only way we can act on environmental issues is by finding a win-win in which both the economy and the environment do well. We're still waiting for that. Um, okay, so, so now we, I'm coming on to what they make of environmentalists. So they basically say that they're naive and emotive. Joe, a business advocate, says, this morning I was listening to Climate Action Newcastle. They're going down to Sydney today to lobby for a 100% renewable energy target by 2020. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would be fantastic. That would be wonderful. Well, it's just not going to happen. It's just not practically possible. Right. So, so they're na naive in the sense that they, may, they, 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 they advocate for positions that, that are economically impractical. So let's not even go there. <clears throat> and then Danielle, who was a lawyer for, for big companies, she goes, the Greens are bad. You know, they've got their little group of experts talking about the same issues in these debates. And I think the Greens are always really emotive. They're not presenting their arguments on an economic and a rational basis. For business, it's just too easy to dismiss them. It's about the emotive radical fringe. So, so the experts that they're talking about are the scientists with high cultural capital, you know, the high uh, knowledge, education, and so on, and formal education, and they're, they're the ones advising environmentalists about what, what the problems are. And that's just, a, from her point of view, that's just a little clique of experts who, <clears throat> and, and it's, what, it's, what is it joined to? It's joined to things that Bourdieu says, according to, to, to those rich in economic capital, they are always saying about those rich in cultural capital. They're idealists, they're just emotional, they don't, they're not practical, uh, they don't look at the material side of things and so forth. And, 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 and often this was equated to religion. So Amanda, who was in the coal industry said, there seems to be this religious fervor about climate change. So long as they're reporting the facts and not just spinning all their using their emotional arguments as their canvas. In other words, <clears throat> she, 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 she promises that she'd listen to them if they weren't getting emotional about you know, the extinction of life on earth. But anyway, let's not go there. So value judgments are unscientific. They're emotive. They're ideals rather than facts. So this relies on a, you know, a really common view of ethics in, in this society based on in David Hume's uh, ideas about ethics. Um, that there's a difference between ethics, which is about emotional things. You know, it really means if you think something is good, it really means I like this. I'm emotionally attached to this to this plan. Okay, so that's that that kind of view of ethics is is, is popular. You know, like it, especially in this context. Uh, <clears throat> so 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 these are ideals rather than facts. They're religious in the sense of appealing to ideas that cannot be verified factually. And, and then what we find also massively interesting in these interviews is that they attack the scientists who, who back up environmentalists in the same fashion. <clears throat> so Paul from Shipping says this. One of the things that shocked me is the brutalness of scientists for their own mantra, their own methodology, that this is the only way, and their ability to sword someone else of their fellow scientists who doesn't agree. I find the fundamentalism of the scientists to be actually breathtaking. So notice the term mantra and then later on fundamentalism associates these scientists with religion, right? So it's not really a factual view, it's a religious view. And that's one thing. And the second thing that he's saying, which is really interesting, is that, and, and, and again, this is a classic critique in terms of Bourdieu's analysis, that these, these cultural capital, high cultural capital people pretend to be holier than thou. They pretend to... To, to be altruistic, they pretend to, that they're looking after, you know, the planet or whatever it may be. <clears throat> but the reality is they're actually just as competitive and self-interested as anybody else. 
and and then James water supply backs up. You know, it's really interesting. Backs up uses it's almost the same words exactly to back this up. Maybe these words were put in the hand, in the, come from the mouth of one of uh, uh, the Australians pundits at that time. Uh, it's science meets religion. There's a bit of a mantra that's hard to break. Yeah, right. So, so a scientist should just stick to the facts. They shouldn't make emotional claims, right? So the problem with environmentalists is that they and and the scientists who back them up is that they they spill it, they 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 let themselves get get it in too emotional. <clears throat> so these scientists who make claims about the environmental crisis are also part of that cultural elite. Their supposed disinterest hides brutal self-interest. And they are also driven by unscientific moral values, meaning like religion is an unscientific moral value. And, 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 and it's a good reference point here. Not saying that they are actually religious, but it's like a religion. The high cultural capital elite pretend to be beyond material interest, but this pretense marks self-interest. So Paul in Shipping goes, I'd love someone to actually get the scientists to bank their house on what they're predicting. I'm very sceptical of scientists of universities because it's about funding and research. And boy, here's a new topic when I get into it. So, 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 the, so the claim then is 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 moral. It's 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 like what? Okay, so what the scientists are doing is they're um, beefing up the, the the dangers of climate change. Why? So they can get funding for their research. Really, it's not that. No, it's not that serious. You know, that's ri ridiculous. Let's discount. You know, like this is why the shoot the messenger thing really works as a title for this for this research. <clears throat> it's like let's not listen to what they say. Let's discount it because we know that they they're driven by the same kind of material interests that drive us. You know, like and that's that's our place in society. And then this mob are just moral posturing. They're not. They're, that's not real. So so. So they wouldn't bank their house on it. I mean, they don't really believe it. And, and yeah. And then here, John from finance was equally sceptical about scientists, um, you know, objectivity. He says, uh, the essence with research is I want to get a certain result, so this is how I'm doing my research, meaning they, they create the result they want to hear. So if they want to hear that, 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 that climate change is a big danger to humanity, they'll, they'll, they'll create research which proves that. And other research, if it was done more neutrally, wouldn't find that at all. No, no, there'd be no way. Okay, and, and here's Stephen from the coal industry. Um, does a number of things in this in this passage, and 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 again, what we find is this um, a propo a proposal to speak for the working class and their material interests. Um, to 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 I say that to identify the material well being in with the economic well being and saying that's what we need to look at and so on. I don't think probably people in Sydney really give a toss for the health of people in Singleton. So Singleton's a mining town out, outside, outside Newcastle. And what he's basically proposing is that environmentalist nutcases from, from inner urban Sydney come up to, to the Hunter region, to Singleton, to demonstrate against the coal industry in Singleton. And it's not, it's not their, I mean, it makes no, the coal industry has no bearing on their material life. So they don't really give a toss for the health of people in Singleton or the dust that people in Singleton might have to put up with. So, and I'm not saying that we accept that there's a problem there, you know, meaning the coal dust is a problem, but it's much more about the role of coal mining as a contributor in their ideas, in their eyes to climate change. So they pretend to be worried about the dust and the health effects of coal dust, but really... No, they've got this mad ideological problem that they think climate change is an issue. I think that is the single best, big, biggest issue at their level. And it's much easier to be quite, I won't say holier than thou, it's easier to be quite, to condemn, et cetera, when you're actually removed from the realities of, of the benefits that mining brings to, to local regions. They don't see those benefits. They don't experience those benefits. So yeah, it's all very well to be worried about climate change, which is something which you know 
happens over there or whatever. <laughs> when 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 you when you're in Singleton, you can see the economic benefits of those coal mines. They're just wonderful. You know, lots of people have jobs, they get well paid, da da da, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The material interests of the economic interests must be central. And they go, and the, the idea of the of the profession of the um of the high cultural elites as holier than now is a is a typical thing. And in a, in a sense, in terms of Bourdieu's analysis, it's quite true. Their role is to moralize and guide the working class, and 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 yeah, and they do they do uh, look for 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 altruistic uh, ideas and, and and develop those those ideas in in contrast to materialism. You know, in, in a critique of materialism. So, so in the, so so he attacks that and says, "Oh, that's just holy than now." Well, it's, in other words, it's exactly what we can expect from this mob of this other class fraction in society. So, rather than listening to the arguments and going, "Well, actually, you know, this is a huge danger to life on Earth and to the economy as we know it," uh, they're going, "No, what can you, you 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 know who's saying this? That's that mob over there, and you know, this is exactly what we'd expect to hear from them." anti-materialistic rubbish ideology emotion <clears throat> and and they and they go so far as to think that that carrying this this kind of ideology too far is a danger to civilization and paul from shipping said we will have social anarchy if we implement the environmental call, call to stop coal <clears throat> and then julie who's a business advocate says it's it's a utopian fantasy. What we what would you expect of a people who have little experience of running the economy? She says people are living in la la land if they think coal's going to be gone overnight. So where's la la land? That's that's the sort of utopian dream that this impractical uh, cultural elites would come up with, right? <laughs> It's not just it's not going to happen, is it? And 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 if it did happen, well, there'd be social anarchy. I mean, you couldn't possibly run an economy without coal. <clears throat> and they defend materialist values in the growth economy. So um, Frank from Aluminium Industry goes, I go to you and say, I'll double your bill, I'll triple your bill, your electricity bill. What will you say? You'll say, No, I don't want that. So, so ordinary people realize how stupid these ideas are, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and, and they're just not going to do it. And then, and James defends the poor people of China, you know, like they need development. These people in China have a real, they want a lifestyle the same as what we have in Australia. And one part of me says, is that an unreasonable request saying that we have that? And I know pay, people say, no, well, you can't have that because you'll harm the planet. And they say, the Chinese. Well, is that fair that you have it and you want us not to have it? So they're, 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 I mean, it's like an extension of, of the ruling elite speaking on behalf of the working class. Now they're speaking on behalf of the developing world. Oh, these people really need, you know, really need coal. Yeah. Um, and, and it'll harm the planet. Like it's, it's, it's portrayed as though it's it, 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 harming the planet is something that might result in a few polar bears dying or, or a, you know, a, a small ant in, in a rainforest or something, but it's not actually going to affect life in general. Wish that was the case. Anyway, <clears throat> um, And then they nail this critique down to the issue of jobs and employment. So Joe, who is a business advocate, said, I mean, the aluminium um, factory, it's got 1,200 employees, but it's got another two, three or 4,000 in supplies, you know, people engaged in supplying. I mean, that's a huge social impact the day that that company decides to close. It's a huge impact. What do we do? I mean, 5,000 people. So, so, the, so what they're saying there is if we put a price on, on carb, fossil fuels it'll increase the price of electricity uh, the aluminium industry uses vast quantities of electricity <clears throat> and if the price goes up they'll have to close their industry and clearly aluminium will be produced in other parts of the world that they don't have these stupid environmentalist rules in and 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 our workers you know five thousand workers will lose their jobs and it's like oh you know like that's the end of the world they couldn't possibly get a different job or anything like that 
And Peter from consulting says, maybe I've got my head in the sand, but if the coal industry does close, there'll be serious problems. Jobs, you know? So, in other words, yeah, just don't think about it. So, as I said before, um, Vanessa and I wrote the, uh, this paper and we called it Don't Shoot the Messenger because the messages of scientists and activists are interpreted through the lens of class politics. They're discounted. You know, you can't expect the truth to come from these people. They're idealists. They're anti-materialists. Their values are completely different from ours. So what they say can't possibly be true. So these are high cult. The, the people that, 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 that are the greenies and scientists, they're the high cultural capital elites. They're members of the professional managerial class that have a role in managing society and making moral judgments. That's exactly what they what they say about about climate change and fossil fuels and so on is exactly the sort of thing that we'd expect coming from this mob. So they can be expected to reject materialist values as an aspect of their class conflict with business elites. They can be expected to reject materialist values as an aspect of the distinction they make between themselves and the uneducated masses. So, so, so the high cultural elites, uh, you know, they're not driven by material needs. They don't, they don't have, uh, oh, how can I put it, low, low, low taste, you know, like they, they don't go to Maccas and consume vast amounts of, of fats and, and sugar and so on and, and, and protein. No, no, they, they have yog yogurt and muesli and I don't know what vegans and so on so so it's like yeah this is this is this is their rejection of materialist values is exactly what we expect of this of this group their anti-materialism is manifested in environmentalist attacks on material consumption through fossil fuels you know these working class people shouldn't be having these gas guzzling cars it's immoral da 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 and it's and, and, and the, yeah, that's where you start from. And then you go, oh, I see, it's destroying the planet, right? Um, <clears throat> they're unrealistic in the, uh, the necessity for material well being through employment in a capitalist economy. Their asceticism, you know, like the, their rejection of material values is opposed because they're actually quite privileged middle class people. Their moralism, their virtue signal, virtue, it's often called virtue signaling, but in, in this kind of critique, is a typical attitude of the professional managerial class vis a vis the working class and economic elites. So it can't be, they can't be trusted. If they're telling it was, we should get rid of fossil fuels, we should move to a new renewal economy. These are moral claims that, that, that we, we could expect from this group. At the end of the day, their environmental message needs to be discounted to get a reasonable understanding of where things are at. You know, so if they say it's like going to kill, you know, I don't know, 45% 40, of the world's species, then must probably it's only 10%, you know, like that'd be the way they think about it. Within this consensus, there are disparate viewpoints. The economic elites pretend they're looking after the material interests of ordinary people and they take capitalism as a given. And then going back to the previous talk as well, the working class distrust economic elites, but they're resigned to the rule of capitalism. We're just being realistic. Capitalists are the ones in control. It is their problem. What can environmentalists draw, draw out of these three talks and, 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 these, and these issues? Um, and, and, and it's difficult. I, in, in some ways, I, I think that um, understanding this context is, is really important for environmentalists, that they're likely and they must expect to be misunderstood in these ways. Um, and, 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 and targeting, in a sense, when you're talking to people in, in the working class or in the the middle class or, 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 or business leaders and so on expect these kind of responses related to class position to be slightly different depending on class position. 
I, I also I also think environmentalists have to be complete. I mean, there's no point in pussyfooting. I think you have to be ruthless in messaging the extent of the crisis because, in a sense, these people already know, as we discovered, and I'll probably, we may talk about that at another time, but <clears throat> there's sort of two-track thinking that they 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 know things are, are pretty dire, but they don't want to talk, they don't want to think about that. And so when when they're addressing the issue of how much they hate environmentalists, they downplay the, the messages. Um, yeah, don't, don't get into moralism, you know, like be clinical in explaining why the capitalist economy is not solving these problems. What, what, what are the issues? Like, um, for, for example, you know, like in, in a sense, the, the, the business leaders are not wrong when they say that if we increase the price of electricity, that aluminium smelters will go overseas and so on and so forth. And you have to, you, you, I mean, it's better to be, to be, uh, to, to, to go, yes, that's a typical problem of the capitalist economy. And, and, and at the end of the day, we, we, we can't easily solve that problem within the context and framework of a capitalist economy. That's what I'd be saying. But if I was going to, going to uh, advise reformist policies, I'd say, yeah, well, we have to accept, first of all, that we are in affluent Australia going to, to lose our living standard in terms of material consumption, material goods, that that's a real that's a reality. Um, we w w the only thing we can do to kind of sweeten that pill is well, first of all, recognise that one of the effects of this will be fewer working hours and more leisure. Uh, and and the second thing to realise about it is that that well, what we need is an economy which redistributes wealth considerably. So, so that ordinary people at the bottom end of the of the labour market in 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 a, in a rich country like Australia, um, and not to mention in developing countries, don't experience this contraction as a complete disaster. We don't want a situation where people have no security in their housing, no security in their work, no security in their medical services or education, or whatever, or transport or access to public events. So, 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 in a way, I, I think, I think, to addressing the 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 affluent working class of the rich countries, we we have to say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Don't pretend that there is. That renewable energy can come in. It can be profitable. It doesn't cost as much as, you know, it doesn't cost any more than fossil fuels. It won't make any difference to our economy if we cut the stop exporting coal. I mean, to my point, from my point of view, that's a load of rubbish. People don't believe you when you say that, and it's better to ad address these these um, questions more honestly. Um, <clears throat> and and and, fi and finally, I suppose you, you, we, we need to ex explain to people that you, you know, like the, the going right back to the fir the first interview I talked about um, of. Um, Margie, like the, the the whole idea of standing back for the for the working class, the, the 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 response is it's their problem. We stand back, let them solve this problem. We don't have anything to do with it. the pro, the The problem is that that's not really an option. We need a groundswell of mass support for massively restructuring the economy. Um, in terms of energy and transport and various other things to, to move to a situation without fossil fuels. And at the end of that restructuring, we cannot expect to continue with the sort of lifestyle and consumption levels that we have now. And, but but it, that's not going to happen if you leave it up to business elites and, and, and so on. And the end result will be that your grandchildren will starve, you know, like, not to put too fine a point on it. And that'll happen just as much in Australia. I mean, obviously, it's going to happen first in India and South Africa and so on, but it'll end up by happening in Australia as well and New Zealand and Tasmania. And da -da -da. I mean, you know, so, so we have to deal with climate change by uh, an all out, you know, emergency response. And, 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 the, and we have to have popular support to do that. I suppose these are fairly obvious things, but I, but I, I I suppose I think for me that the, the important thing to 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 look at is 
to be aware of or, or why the how these class conflicts get played out in relationship to environmentalist politics and, and be sensitive and sympathetic to to where people are coming from with this okay i'll finish up there <laughs>